Hello, fellow Movie Crusaders, and welcome to my latest episode. My name is Sean Wasserkrug, and today we're going to be doing another one of my mass review roundups where I'm going to be reviewing multiple movies on one uh, one video just because there are so many movies and just not enough time to shoot individual videos or edit individual videos in that much time. So we're going to be reviewing four films on this video. We're going to be reviewing uh, Cyrano, Hulu's Fresh, uh, Disney Plus's and Pixar's Turning Red, and Netflix's The Atom Project. Uh, first, we'll go with uh, into Cyrano. Now, for Cyrano, this was a movie that actually, for the most part, was actually pretty excited to see. Um, it came out uh, earlier in the year. It is a 2021 film, but came out uh, in January. But because of where I'm located, it did not become available until uh, it hit uh, on demand or streaming or anything like that until earlier uh, this week. Uh, so, I mean, this review is kind of an older review, but nonetheless, this is the first time I got to watch it. Uh, huge fan of Peter Dinklage. I've loved Peter Dinklage even before his Game of Thrones Game of Thrones days. Uh, and so seeing him in a musical, especially based off of this Cyrano character, which I, I think a lot of people know who Cyrano is, whether it's from the Steve Martin um, film Roxanne, uh, or many, many other iterations of Cyrano. Uh, I was definitely excited to see what Peter Dinklage could do with this, plus it being an actual musical. Um, going into what the actual film, I mean, if for anyone who doesn't know what Cyrano is, Cyrano is basically um, too self-conscious to woo the woman he loves, Roxanne himself. Wordsmith Cyrano, uh, I forgot how to say his last name and I don't want to butcher it, um, helps a young Christian nab her heart through love letters. Um, basically, you got you got Cyrano, which in most of the iterations, especially with Steve Martin's iteration, he had a really, really big nose. Uh, and it was too self-conscious and self-pride to try to make it, or try to go for Roxanne. So he, had, he picks a guy who she actually is has a huge crush on and kind of gives him his words to make her fall in love with him. Uh, in this case, because uh, it's Peter Dinklage, just because Cyrano is um, a little person, he thinks that Roxanne, played by Haley Bennett, uh, would never give him the time of day. They are best friends, but she would never see him as a lover. Uh, so she falls for uh, Kelvin Harrison Jr.'s Christian, and thus the story uh, goes on. And uh, she's also betrothed to uh, Ben Mendelsohn's De Juge. I don't know French. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Um, the main thing is, how does Peter, D Peter Dinklage do as Cyrano? And I think for the most part, Peter Dinklage is fantastic at reading dialogue. And so giving him the role of someone like Cyrano is a really, really strong point. Now, by turning this into a musical, a lot of people are wondering, can Peter Dinklage sing? Uh... He's, he's fine. He's not the best singer at all by any means, but most of his singing in this is kind of him reading the, the lyrics and kind of adding a little bit of a hum to the, uh, to the actual song itself. It's not bad, though. Um, I actually enjoyed his singing through the film because I thought it felt natural for the serial character that he was portraying in this film. Uh, Haley Bennett's Roxanne, um, she is... A uh, very good singer, um, but there was never really a time in the movie that I really cared or understood why Cyrano loved Roxanne in this film, other than just she was the only woman in the movie that seemed to really ever treat Cyrano kindly or such uh, with such lovingness. Um, granted, that's the way the movie is framing this. It's not like we see Cyrano really talk to anyone else in the film outside of the three leads that I already mentioned. Um... But there was just, to me, not really that much for Haley Bennett to do outside of just, you know, pine over the Christian character and then seeing herself. Uh, Kelvin Harrison Jr. as Christian, I've never really seen the guy before. I think he does a really, really solid job as Christian. I think he does a great job of portraying this this kind of guy who doesn't really understand um, that he's being, I don't, he's not necessarily being played by Cyrano, because Cyrano in his mind is generally trying to help him out. But as the movie goes, you can kind of see him try to veer off and kind of get it in on his own way. Um, but I think Kelvin does a solid job as the Christian character. Definitely the best singer of the group, uh, hands down. Um, and I, I could see a, a good career for Kelvin if he's if he's given the right kind of cast, right script, right director. 
Um, so he was definitely a solid part of the film. Ben Mendelsohn, uh, I'm not going to try to say the character's name again because I'm going to say it wrong. Ben Mendelsohn plays a villain a lot, and I really love his villain characters in a lot of his movies. This one, I feel like they just didn't give Mendelsohn enough time to really do anything uh, to be villainy. Um, I mean, he, he does what he can with what he has in this film, uh, but it just didn't seem like it was the right role for Ben Mendelsohn in this. I feel like they could have casted uh, a lot of other people for this role, and they probably would have done just about as much, or if not the same, as performance as Mendelsohn did. Um, the rest of the cast is kind of not really that important. Um, I thought Bashir Salahuddin's uh, Labrette was going to be a lot bigger in this film, uh, who's like Cyrano's kind of best friend outside of Roxanne, but they really don't give him that much really to do. Uh, in terms of the music, to me, that is kind of where the movie kind of falls off for me. The music... I don't really like the beat. I don't like the tone they did with a lot of the music. A lot of it was really trying to talk really, really fast or sing really, really fast without letting any of the actors or actresses really kind of breathe or or run uh, a lot of their lyrics. It was just, like, especially with Haley Bennett, there's one particular song she sings. It's after a interaction with Christian where part of me was just like, I feel like she's trying to rush through this song, which I know that's not the case, but... There's parts where it's just like, if she just let herself run that word off a little better and just kind of pause a second, I felt like the song probably would have meant more or would have hit better. But a lot of the music is just kind of, po not poorly written, but it's poorly played, thus making it harder for them to portray the songs better. And I think that was a lot for a lot of uh, the cast in this, except for Christian. I think Christian's music, or when he sings... They really gave him time to breathe and sing like a normal musical or sing like a normal uh, person would. Whereas with uh, Sir, or Dinklage and Bennett, they had to kind of rush through a lot of their songs and a lot of their lyrics. Like they were trying to do something like a Lin-Manuel Miranda rap, but it just doesn't flow, if that, if that makes any sense. And if you guys watch the movie, you guys will probably know what I'm talking about. The story itself, I think, is fine. There's certain scenes here and there to me that kind of bothered me. The infamous scene with Christian being fed lines from Cyrano off to the side as he's talking to Roxanne on her, um, like, her deck porch, whatever you want to call her window, to me just kind of sound, made Roxanne feel really, really stupid. Uh, I know that that's a infamous scene for the Cyrano character, but in this movie, Dinklage starts talking for Christian. He never changes his voice. He does nothing to hide the fact that it is Cyrano talking, and Roxanne just kind of still thinks it's Christian, and Kelvin Harrison and Peter Dinklage's voice levels are way too different for her to really believe that that was Christian talking to her the entire time, so it kind of made the Roxanne character look really dumb. Uh, nonetheless, Cyrano, it's not a bad film. I thought it was a fine musical. It's just not one that I would probably ever really go back and rewatch over again, and I really wanted that to be something for Cyrano. Because uh, like cast-wise, I think they all do a solid job. And the story is very interesting all the way up to the very end. There's just the music itself kind of fails. I think this movie probably would have done a lot better had they not made it a musical and just told a thorough, well-thought-out story with these actors. But nonetheless, it's a musical. It is what it is. Um, going to my score, I'm going to give uh, Cyrano a 70%. Uh, going off to my next film, we're going to talk about Fresh on Hulu. Uh, I didn't really know this movie existed. I really didn't. The only reason um, I had heard about Fresh was because everyone kept talking about this performance by Sebastian Stan and that it was a horror film, and that was basically it. I didn't know what was the horror film about it. I didn't know anything about the plot, and I just decided, screw it. Let's watch it and see what happens. I'm going to say the same thing for you guys. For anyone watching this movie or wants to know what Fresh is about, Go in without watching the trailers. Go in as blind as you can because you not knowing what's going on in this film until things happen, I think heightens this film. I think it makes it a lot better. Um, the general plot, and I'm going to go as, as general as I can with this, is um, the horrors of modern dating seen through one young woman's defiant battle to survive her new boyfriend's unusual kinks. Um, and that is kind of where you go, and a lot of people are going, oh, this is like a Fifty Shades of Grey kind of thing, but horror, and yeah, you're not 
wrong, but it doesn't go to that kind of extent. Uh, you got Noah, played by Daisy Edgar Jones. She's a woman that we really see at the beginning of the film who, she's on the dating apps, she's going on the shitty dates with a bunch of, like, douchebag guys. We only really see one date here in the film. And, I mean, we've all been there. I'm on the dating apps myself. They're horrible. Until she kind of has a meet cue at the grocery store with Sebastian Stan's Steve. They really hit it off. They go on dates. They start to become a couple. Uh, and then they decide to go on a trip with each other. Once they are on that trip, Noah starts to realize that Steve is a lot more different than she bargained for. And I'm not going to mention anything else after that. Um, Fresh is... Definitely a fresh new take on the horror genre with this kind of story element. I think Sebastian Stan as Steve. Sebastian Stan does a fantastic job with this character. Um, I think it, it's uh, definitely something we haven't seen him do because we're used to seeing him as, you know, Bucky in Winter Soldier. And uh, I apologize for the dogs barking in the background. They are just going nuts, and I'm not going to pause the video to tell them to shut up. Um, but... Uh, Sebastian Stan, uh, does a fantastic job of Steve. He does this kind of thing. If anyone's ever seen the, sh the, t the Netflix show You with Penn Bagley, he's, he's, he's fantastic as being this charming guy, but just like on You, it's like, he's charming and likable, but he's a stalker. And with Sebastian Stan Steve, he's surprisingly charming and likable, but XYZ. And that is kind of the big thing that, da that Daisy Edgar Jones' Noah has to deal with, is that, this is a bad guy. She has to get out. She has to escape. But Steve also, their chemistry between Noah and Steve and between Daisy Edgar Jones and Sebastian Stan work incredibly well. And I actually really love watching their their back and forth on camera with each other. Also, the the where they're at, the location. Most of this movie is going to take place in this this like house cottage or wherever they're at in the second. Basically, once they go on this trip. It also kind of gives me a little bit of an Ex Machina vibe. If anyone's ever seen Ex Machina, once they're in the house and between the, the uh, two main male characters and the robot played by Alicia Vikander, it's a very kind of secluded, almost suffocating vibe. And Fresh gives that same kind of detail to it as well, where you have these weird, unique moments of, of them just having these weird conversations and dancing and all that kind of stuff and i think the framing of the direction of this film by uh uh was it was it a uh, mimi cave i think does a really good job of making this a very unique type of horror film uh molly uh, play, uh played by jojo t gibbs is noah's best friend she's a subplot of the film because she's trying to find noah that i feel like they could have done a little bit better on probably maybe uh struck that a little bit harder to allow us to have something that's going on outside the world um, there's also a, a, other characters that they kind of try to give some story to, but they don't really delve into it deep enough for us to really care, or their storylines just abruptly end. There's one character, Paul, that has a funny end, but also was just kind of like, I, we're going to go back to that, right? And, and we never do. Um, if they kept it kind of more tight-knit with just Steve and Noah... And, and that was it. Uh, I think this movie would have been a lot stronger. But branching out to Molly and Paul and other characters um, and then not really hitting it hard on those characters, it just kind of felt like a bunch of loose ends that were just kind of there to give us a breather from the Steve Noah storyline that really just wasn't necessarily needed. Nonetheless, Fresh does a great job of being a unique horror on streaming services. Like I said, this is on Hulu. That a lot of people probably would just kind of go, oh, this is a crappy streaming horror film. But it actually ends up being probably a very good surprise horror film that I actually wouldn't mind reliving and going down the road and rewatching this again and again. It's very of today with dating services. Great casting by Daisy Edgar Jones. I think she does a fantastic job. Didn't really know anything about her going to this film. I can't wait to see her in whatever else she brings up in, in the future. Sebastian Stan, it's great seeing him in something different than Bucky and his other roles. Uh, strong recommendation for this. Check out Fresh if you can. I'm going to give Fresh a 75%. Uh, going to my next film, we got Disney Pixar's Turning Red on Disney+. Plus, um, Not in theaters, uh, which has kind of been, I guess, the new trend for Pixar films is not going in theaters. And for me, Pixar, I love Pixar. I do. I have been a Pixar fan since day one when Toy Story came out. But for me, I have not been a real big fan 
of the last few Pixar films. To me, the last good Pixar film was Onward. Uh, and that doesn't mean I didn't like Soul or Luca, but they were just kind of, they were fine. I don't love them. They aren't, when I think of Pixar films, I don't think of those two films. Uh, they, to me, are in the same kind of area as like Good Dinosaur and the Cars films, where they are fine, but they're not Pixar level to me. And I was hoping with Turning Red, we were probably going to break that mold, because frankly, if we're going as a kind of a friendly rivalry, the Disney animated film uh, films have been outshining the Pixar films as of late with Encanto and, um, of course, I had the list and then I lost it. But the last three Disney animated films have really outperformed the Disney Pixar films. Uh, so going into Turning Red, the story we follow, uh, Mei Lin, um, she's basically a, I believe, yeah, 13, 12, 13 year old girl, uh, who turns into basically a giant red panda whenever she gets too excited. If the story sounds familiar to a lot of people, it's basically a, eighth grade version of Teen Wolf with uh, Michael J. Fox. Uh, we, like I said, uh, we follow uh, Melanie, played by Rosalind Chang, um, her mother Ming, played by Sandra Oh, her father um, Oren Lin, played, or, who plays Jin. And uh, basically, like I said, the main plot is Mel Melanie, Mel or Mei, Mei Lin um, wakes up one day, and she's a red panda, and she can control or not be able to control her turning from a red panda back to her human form based off of her emotions. If she gets too overly excited or overly stimulated, she'll turn into the red panda. And apparently this is a, a family curse that they have to wait a certain time to do a ritual to try to get rid of it. But when Maylin decides to turn this into uh, basically a option for her to go see her favorite boy band, Four Town, um, she learns to adapt and beloved the Red Panda part of herself. And so that's kind of the main story we have going on with this. The movie takes place in, I think it was 2002, 2003. So you got Tamagotchis, you got uh, boy bands and all that kind of stuff, which is real driving force of the character in this film. Um, for me, with Turning Red, uh, looks good because it's a Pixar film. No Pixar film really looks bad. Uh, but in terms of the cast, I think voice cast-wise, I think everyone does a solid job of the film. The main thing is the story. This is definitely a story for teenage girls, moms, uh, not so much for the boys and the men. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, for me, the plot of Turning Red or the story for Turning Red really didn't do anything for me. I didn't really love the story. I didn't really strike the characters with the story. I didn't really feel for the characters in the story. Um, I will say this, my favorite part of the story was definitely, uh, Malin's friends. Uh, really loved the friends, uh, Miriam, played by Ava Morse, uh, Morris, uh, was definitely, to me, the highlight of the film. Her other two friends, uh, I think it was Abby and Priya, they're all unique in their own little ways. They're a very awesome support group for Malin. I think, um, that, to me, is the crux of this film. If you have these kinds of friends in your life, this is going to be very, um... Kind of, it's gonna it's gonna hit your 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 heart in certain areas, and then if you also ever had a overbearing mother or father, mainly mother in the story, you're really gonna be able to understand the character development of Maylin and Ming, played by Sandra Oh. To me, that storyline, it was a little too over the top for me in certain respects. There's certain parts where the Ming character does some things where I'm like, well, this is just ridiculous that a mom would do this. Um, but it's added. I think. It, I think it's kind of over exaggerated, you know, overdone because for the comedy aspect of the Pixar films. But nonetheless, Turning Red does have a lot of fun moments, has a lot of heart in the film, uh, and it, it can be enjoyed. It is. It is a solid Pixar film, just like Luca, and and Soul. Is it going to be one that I'm going to go back to, going, oh my god, I can't wait to watch Turning Red? No, this is probably not a Pixar film I would ever really go back and rewatch. But that's just me. I'm sure a ton of people, and I've heard, I've seen the reviews, a ton of people are loving this film, or it's really touching home to them. Uh, like I said, it all depends on the story. Does the story hit you? Does the story do anything for you? And for me, it's not my, it's to, to go like with um, Whiplash, it's not my tempo. Uh, and it's the 2002 set piece, I also think else didn't really matter to the storyline and i get why they did 2002 it was for the director because that's how she was malin's age 
in uh, you know in 2002, so she wanted to make this a little more personal to her, which is fine. Um, and I, I guess because the boy band thing was such a driving force of the film, obviously boy bands they're still pop, they're not as popular today as they were back then. So maybe that's why they did that. But to me, there are some there's a lot of dialogue with the characters that is not very 2010. It's more present day, so it just doesn't uh, connect thoroughly. But like I said, if you're a girl or a woman, uh, especially adolescent uh, girls, you guys are going to love Turning Red. If you've, like I said, had these situations in your life with these close-knit friends or an overbearing mother, Turning Red is going to work for you. It just did not work for me. Nonetheless, Pixar does what they do best. Beautiful visualizations, great story, great voice cast, just not my kind of story. I'm going to give Turning Red also a 70%. Going to our final film, it is Netflix's The Atom Project. This is the, I want to say the third Ryan Reynolds Netflix film. Uh, we had uh, Six Underground with Michael Bay, which was not a good film. And then we had last year's Red Notice, which was very popular, but to me it was kind of a disappointment. Uh, with The Atom Project, we're going to the sci-fi uh, story now, where we have a time-traveling pilot who teams up with his younger self, and his late father to come to terms with his past while surviving the future. Um, this is going to be very 80s nostalgia-esque. Uh, granted, even though the story is in the 2000s, um, people who are fans of The Last Starfighter, E.T., um, anything like Le the, the Flight, of the Nav or Flight of the Navigator, uh, I think this movie is really going to hit a lot stronger for you, which it did for me. Ryan Reynolds plays uh, Big Adam in this film. Uh, he's the time-traveling pilot who goes back to, I believe it's 2022. Uh, yeah, he goes back to present day, basically 2022, to try and stop something from happening. I'm not going to say what for, for storyline purposes. He was trying to get to 2018, but ended up crashing in 2022, where he meets his younger self, played by Walker Scobell. Um, and those two together need to work together to try and, A, make it back to 2018 to you know, help his mission, and basically help save the day and save someone very special to Big Adam. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, this is going to be one of those things, and we said this with uh, other Ryan Reynolds films, if you are a fan of Ryan Reynolds and his quips and his charm and all that kind of stuff, you're going to love The Adam Project. If you're not a fan of Ryan Reynolds, I think you're still really going to like The Adam Project. You're just not going to love it as much as someone like me. Um... You got also Mark Ruffalo, who plays Adam's dad, and you got Jennifer Gardner, who plays uh, Adam's mom, uh, Louis and Ellie. Uh, Zoe Saldana plays Laura, who's a special character to Big, a or Big Adam in the film. You also got Catherine Keener, who plays Maya Sorin. Um, and you got Alex Malari Jr., who plays uh, Christo. So those are kind of the main cast of this film. Um, the biggest standout of this movie, outside of Ryan Reynolds, Ruffalo, and Jennifer Gardner, is Walker Scoble. Walker Scoble, this is his first film. His very first film, and he has a big task. He has to embody one of the larger-than-life uh, actors in Hollywood, in Ryan Reynolds. You have to believe, is Walker Scoble a young Ryan Reynolds? And the answer is, does he pull it off? Hell yes, he does. There is so many scenes in this movie where I'm watching Walker as young Adam play, and I'm watching his facial reaction, and I'm watching his dialogue, and he plays it perfectly to a younger Ryan Reynolds. And yes, you can chalk it up to a good script of being able to basically write the write the words that Ryan Reynolds would say, but if you don't deliver them in a Ryan Reynolds-esque way, then it just looks, you know, it falls flat. Walker does a fantastic job of portraying a younger Ryan Reynolds, and the chemistry between these two is what really makes this movie work. Um, the, the action that we do get in the film is a lot of fun and enjoyable to watch. There's some good sci-fi scenes uh, for this as well. Um, the, but the big thing with The Adam Project that's really going to make a lot of people love this movie, and what I loved about this movie, is that there is a ton of heart in this film. Uh, Big Adam is, goes, is going through a lot of, to, of, of issues with his past, especially with his parents, and he wants to make, basically, uh, he wants to fix that. So him coming back also, on top of trying to save the world, basically, uh, is, is trying to fix these issues and also trying to get young Adam to kind of wake up. But the beautifulness of this all is that young Adam teaches Big Adam a lot more than you would think. And these moments that Big Adam has with Jennifer Gardner's Ellie and Mark Ruffalo's Lewis are, are beautiful in the film, as well as with Walker as young Adam. 
Um, this movie, to me, I love this movie. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite movies of the year. Fantastic action. Uh, fantastic story, in my opinion. There are some story elements that don't quite work. I think the uh, villain characters of this film probably could have been a little bit better or given a little more time to really kind of show why um they they were such big villains i also think they could have done a little bit better with the future-esque aspect of it but nonetheless the story of this film is a lot of fun the heart is great and i enjoyed watching walker scoble and ryan runs on screen together uh and mark ruffalo jeff garner back again um i think the last time we saw them together was 13 going on 30 so if you love 13 going on 30 seeing them two together on screen again also a big bonus for everyone on here uh this is a Netflix film that should have went to theaters. This is one of those movies I think would have done phenomenal at the box office that they release this in theaters, but it is on Netflix. This is a strong, strong recommendation. Go out of your way to check out The Adam Project. It is definitely a movie that I'm going to rewatch many, many, many times here in the near future, and I think a lot of people feel the same way. Uh, if you guys have not seen it, go out of your way to see The Adam Project. I'm going to give The Adam Project an 85%. Um... I hope you guys enjoyed these reviews. If you guys did, go ahead and hit that like, share, and subscribe button to the channel so you guys stay up to date with all the latest videos that pop up on the Movie Crusaders. And of course, we're going to follow us on all the social media outlets you see below. Uh, coming up next, Brian Michaels and myself, we will be doing our Movie Crusaders award show where we are going to be giving out awards for movies in 2021. Also, next week, we'll have our Actor, Actress, Director Showcase where we'll be get, talking about Bruce Willis, Sandra Bullock, and Edgar Wright. And then on the 25th, we'll be doing our Movie Crusaders Oscars show where we're going over predictions and our picks of who we would have nominated for supporting actress, actor, uh, best actor, best actress, director, and best picture, as well as all the other movie reviews coming out during that time. If they're very singular uh, reviews being released, I'll do an individual review for them. If there's a lot of movies coming out at once, I'll probably do another one of these where I'm just dropping all four at once here. Uh, but anyway, I hope you guys stay tuned for all that. And until next time, in case I don't see you, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, Movie Crusaders. You're still here. It's over. Go home.